There was a philosopher who taught in New York who was also ordained as a rabbi, famous not only for the brilliance of his intellect, but for his wit. And his name was Sidney Morgan Besser. And there are a lot of stories told about Morgan Besser, but I'm only going to tell you one. The most famous is the time he was sitting in the lecture of J.L. Austin, who was a very well-known language philosopher from England. And Austin was making the following point. He said, two negatives make a positive, but two positives don't make a negative. So if I say it is false that it is false, that means it's true. But if I say it's true that it is true, that still means it's true. So he said two negatives make a positive, but in no language, said Austin, do two positives make a negative. And from the back of the room, Morgan Besser yelled out, yeah, right. <laughs> Negatives are really important. Negatives, even though we have a negative image of them, actually matter in some ways as much as positives, and you can't have one without the other. Keats talked about negative capability, which he said was essential for an artist. Negative capability is being able to be uncertain without having to always make your mind up about something. Our society is one in which there's almost no negative capability. You ask someone about any issue, about any personality, and they will, almost no one will say, you know, I need more information. I really don't know that I have a developed opinion yet. That's negative capability. I want to talk about negative imagination. That is, to imagine things that aren't. Not that could one day be, but that used to be. And I'll give you a simple example of what I have in mind. I've mentioned before, when I fly on a plane and the plane is five minutes late, I think, I can't believe I'm going to be late. What do I not imagine at that time? A covered wagon. A ship where you have to be in steerage, or just walking. In other words, I take for granted what is and always wish it to be better, and I forget to imagine what doesn't exist anymore. If you take the most dangerous city in America in the most dangerous time on the most dangerous block, it is still a hundred times safer than the nicest neighborhood of medieval London, where people got killed all the time. Remember Master of the House from Les Mis? There was no Holiday Inn. You traveled from one place to another, and you had to stay at places, and you had no idea since there was no Airbnb rating. And this reality of what our lives were before is something that you always hear older people tell younger people. You don't know, when I was growing up, we had to walk through 10-foot snowdrifts on the way to school. But if the younger person were savvy enough, they would say, really? I'll bet that was better than what your great-grandparents had to do. Because we don't have that negative imagination of what wasn't there beforehand and what it would be like if it wasn't there now. So let me just remind you 
A lot of Jews say, we know what happened when there wasn't in Israel, there was a Holocaust. That is much too simple. Last week, on Friday, June 9th, almost nobody in our community recognizes it, but it was the 20th of Sivan. In 1171, for the very first time in the community of Blois, 40 Jews were killed, and it was the first time that the government cooperated in a pogrom against the Jews. In fact, the 20th of Sivan in certain communities is still commemorated because it shocked the Jewish world, but does anyone remember it? No. The spring was the time of the Gezerot Tach Vetatz, the Chelnitsky pogroms in 1648 and 1649, where tens of thousands of Jews were killed. When we talk about what it is not to have an Israel, our automatic go-to is Germany. But remember, it's not just what happened in Eastern Europe. It's what happened here, too. Do you know why Anne Frank died in Auschwitz? It's because Oskar Strauss, though a friend of Roosevelt, though a very rich man, tried to get the Frank family a visa and couldn't succeed. It's what happened all over the world throughout Jewish history. We were guests and often unwelcome guests in other people's homes. And the reason I call for negative imagination is when someone gets up and talks about Israel today, they say, look what's going on in Israel, and they either love the demonstrations in the streets or they don't like the demonstrations in the streets as though that's Israel. But if you have any sense of Jewish history, if you know what it is to actually not have an Israel, and by the way, we just blessed the month of Tammuz, which is the month in which Nebuchadnezzar smashes the outer walls of Jerusalem and begins the destruction of the temple. And we just read this morning of the spies who were the first tentative incursions in Israel thousands of years ago. If you remember what it is to have an Israel, it's not the Holocaust alone. It's Ethiopian Jews thinking they will never see anything other than what they lived with until the coming of the Messiah or Soviet Jews living under the jackboot of communism with no hope. or our ancestors, who again and again and again were subject to the cruel whims of other people. What is it like not to have an Israel? This time I'm shifting ground, not just in Israel the country, but in Israel the people? Well, apart from the fact that the modern world wouldn't have had Kafka or Freud or Einstein or Proust or Marx. If you look, as I did, just the very beginning of Norman Lebrecht's genius and anxiety, he has the following paragraph. Without Jews, you wouldn't have Carl Landsteiner and no blood transfusions or major surgery. Without Paul Ehrlich, no chemotherapy. Without Siegfried Marcus, no motor car. Without Rosalind Franklin, no no model of DNA. Without Fritz Haber, not enough food to sustain life on Earth. Without Jean-Vive Halevi, no grand opera. And on and on and on. When people slide away from our people, I wonder if they realize, I wonder if they have enough negative information, negative imagination to think of what the world would be without these people. They didn't come about by chance. They came about because they were part of a culture 
that trained human beings to think about the world a different way, that trained human beings to argue a different way, that trained human beings to think. Remember, the one thing that kept us together were shared stories and shared books. There is a software maven who's trying to create virtual communities that are non-geographic. He wants to create worldwide networks. And you know what he uses as a model? The Jews. Because he says, where else is there a worldwide community where everybody connected to everybody and everybody shared and everybody knew and when they met each other, they immediately had something in common. The only place I can find that is among the Jews. Now just imagine if we weren't here. A world without Israel, like a world without Jews, is a terrifying world. And we don't support Israel because its actions today or yesterday or tomorrow or last week or last month are exactly what we would do or wouldn't do. It's an existential question. You don't love your kid because they got an A. And you don't stop loving them because they failed the exam. You understand that your fate and your heart and your soul is bound up with this person. And that's what it is to be a Jew. And that's what it is to love Israel. It has conditions of approval, but it has no conditions of love. You can be angry, you can disapprove. You can say, this is terrible, and they shouldn't have done this, and they shouldn't have done that, and they should do the other thing. But you can say that about your kids, too, or about your parents. But at the end of the day, just remember, even if you didn't live through it, with negative imagination, what is a world without an Israel? What is it for the Jewish people, but also what is it for the world? It is very difficult for us to remember how precariously Jews lived in this world before there was an Israel. We were nervous and we were scared. And that includes Jews in America. If you ask, why didn't Jews in America protest more vociferously, more self-confidently, more loudly what was going on in Europe? Because people knew. My paradoxical answer is because there was no Israel. Israel gave American Jews the self-confidence to stand up as American Jews, and before Israel, they were scared, and if you doubt that, just look at how much they didn't speak in the course of the Second World War. But you know, when it came time for the Soviet Union to put pressure on them, now that there was an Israel, American Jewry rose up against the greatest nuclear power in the world, except for the United States, and spoke with no hesitation. My parents smuggled Torahs into the Soviet Union. My mother smuggled Torahs, believe me. My mother couldn't stand when you put your elbows on the table. It's really hard to believe that she was a smuggler. But there was an Israel, and they felt secure in this world. And they weren't afraid. And many, many, many other American Jews did that, which is such a contrast to what happened 
30, 40, 50 years before. We would do much better as a community if we relearn how to unlearn what we have and cast our minds back to what it was like when we didn't have it. Not only would it make us more grateful and more appreciative, which is always important, but it would also keep us from going off track when this happens or that happens and being so reactive and so immediate that we forget what really matters. When something bad happens in Israel, I don't like it, you don't like it. When Israel is responsible, I really don't like it. But it has nothing to do on any level with my deep love for the land and my knowledge that Israel is indispensable for Jewish survival, for Jewish flourishing, and, I believe, for the world. This is not an easy message to get across to younger people for two reasons. One, they don't have an experience at all of an Israel that seems weak or embattled. And two, they're young. They're young. And when you're young, by and large, your ideals have not been tested by frailty and weakness and failure and the knowledge that you've been wrong and that you're just a part of a sweep of history and not actually the best thing that history has thrown up in the thousands of years that it existed. We felt the same way. It's not just today. But it is really important to emphasize and re-emphasize that Israel is a bulwark against tyranny in this world, against savagery, against cruelty, and against destruction. We know, we've seen it again and again and again. We saw it in Chalnitsky, we saw it in Bloy, and we, God knows we saw it throughout the 20th century. So I want to say how grateful I am that this synagogue has never wavered. When I've spoken in support of Israel, I have never gotten pushback. And I'm so proud that even as I speak, one of my two successors is in Israel with a program that he created to train rabbis to see Israel in the terms that I just spoke about. Because this synagogue and synagogues like it, if there's another synagogue like it, you need to lead the way. You need to spread the message. We need to be the explanatory vanguard of our people and of our land. We live in the most miraculous times in Jewish history. Thousands of years, Hebrew was not a spoken language and Israel was not a Jewish state. And it is. And we're here to celebrate it. Let's not let other people forget that not only is Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people are alive, but so is the Jewish land alive. And God willing, it will be until whenever the Messiah comes. And even if the Messiah, as I suspect, takes a really long time to get here,
when that Messiah comes, we will find him in an Israel that is a Jewish state. Shabbat Shalom.